I don't know about you, but I have a hard time figuring out if I can trust the things I read, especially on my computer. And I want to make something clear. Now, I'm not really the kind of guy who is usually just distrustful of people, nor am I someone who thinks everyone who puts pen to paper or fingers to a keyboard is lying through his or her teeth, nor am I someone who buys into conspiracy theories or any of that kind of stuff, all can be found on the internet. That's just not me. But there is just so much stuff out there, millions and millions of sites containing every sort of story, fact, opinion, and at times, deliberate misinformation. And of course, what makes sifting through all of this stuff really difficult is the fact that most of the things I read are by people or organizations or companies of which I know little or nothing about. Naturally, there are some organizations and media outlets that have been around for a very long time and have a long history of trustworthiness. And I do frequent those sites first. And we all should be discovering new information. But like many of you, I often start on one site but then soon find myself clicking on a link and being transported to some article or blog containing the thoughts or research or opinions of someone who is completely anonymous to me. How do I determine whether or not I should place some confidence in what I'm now reading? Who is this person? What's his or her background or education? Do they have any connections to other publications that I trust and I have read? It's not an easy task out there on the internet highway. And it can become at times a little frustrating. Think about it for a second. The phrase, I read it on the internet, has become both a serious attempt at defending an argument, but it's also become a joke depending who's uttering those words and in what context. Now, I bring all of this up because today's readings make me think about all the different ways many of us think about and engage our minds in most important texts. And I can't find anything on the face of the earth that is more important than the holy words of sacred scripture. In our first reading, we see Ezra, a priest scribe, standing before the people and reading from the law, the Torah. After two generations of exile from the Jewish people in Babylonia, and the people wept, overjoyed that their faith had not been destroyed and that their sacred texts had not disappeared forever. And of course, in the gospel passage from Luke, we see Jesus reading passages from Isaiah in the synagogue as any good, faithful, and practicing Jewish man would do. By this time, however, Jesus had gotten sort of a reputation as a wise and learned teacher. He's also got the reputation of being a miracle worker. And so the people present Listen very carefully in anticipation of what Jesus might illuminate for them at the end of the passage. What Jesus said, of course, was not what they expected, but we'll get back to that later. What is clear from these readings is the degree to which the Jewish community put their faith in their sacred texts. These words meant something for them. It meant a great deal to them. And many died rather than deny what was written on those scrolls. They were critical to their identity, to, to who they were as a people of faith. 
They looked at these texts for guidance and inspiration and instruction. Simply, they trusted what they what had been written down through the centuries. They trusted that these words from the hearts and minds of the faithful who had come before them were for their spiritual well-being and for their own edification. Can we still trust these sacred texts, the Holy Scripture, the Holy Bible presented to us in this day and age? with what we know about the world and the cosmos and biology and evolution and chemistry and genetics and psychology? Or do we have to be careful in much the same way as when we are on the internet and be suspicious about every word, every sentence, every quote? Put simply, can we still trust the Bible? Well, if by trust we mean find an answer to every problem, well, the answer is no. It's not that and never has been that. Believe it contains black and white solutions to all the gray areas of our life. The answer is no. It's not that. Never has it been that think that the only truths about spiritual matters are found within it and nowhere else, then again the answer is no. It's not that. Never has been. That by reading it, every one of our doubts will quickly and completely go away? Well, the answer comes back, no. It's not that either. Never has been and never can be. Accept all of its cosmology or history as scientific fact? Well, no. It's not that either. Never has it been. Believe that it was divinely dictated and that the authors are superficialists. Well, again, the answer is no. It's not that either. Never has it been either. Use its text confidently as the final word in every argument, as proof that we are right and others are wrong? Well, the answer is no. It's not that either. Never has been. Well, if it's none of those things that I just described, then what exactly do we trust about the Holy Scriptures, or maybe more precisely, what exactly can we trust about the texts? Although I cannot go into the whole history of the Bible and how it was compiled because of lack of time, and I was reminded that in the sacristy that we need to be out within an hour, nor go into everything the church says about these sacred texts, a couple things, though, might be helpful here. First, we as Catholics don't believe that the Bible is to be taken literally in every respect. The Bible is a collection of all sorts of books, books of all different styles written by very human authors under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of course, for different purposes and at different times in history for different reasons. And that means it must be interpreted. And we believe in faith that in the Christian community, more specifically in the Catholic Christian community, who must do the interpreting also under the guidance of the Holy Spirit must determine what these texts say about who we are. And principally, principally, in a formal sense, we believe that the responsibility for that task lies ultimately with certain people in authority within the Holy Roman Catholic Church. We have the absolute truth when we work as the unit the church is divine, and that is 
from sacred tradition, from the authority of the church's teachings, and of course, from sacred scripture. And of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, we have scholars and theologians and bishops. My friends, this is a blessing, for it provides us with boundaries and guardrails to help us not come up with interpretations that are way off course, like believing the bread is only a piece of bread, not the body of Christ. Interpretations which betray or mislead us in faith, we will not find God please within the Holy Roman Catholic Church because we have the abs absolute truth on our side when we use all of the graces God gives us in our Catholic Church. It's not what I think when I preach, but what God wants and what God expects. It is God's message that is coming across, and I have Rome to keep me on that track to be an authentic homilist reflecting the eternal truths of Almighty God. When I'm behind this mic, I don't share with you my personal opinion, though my personal opinion many times are in complete align with what I'm preaching. Secondly, sacred scripture is meant to be understood in its entirety as a kind of unified whole, as a beautiful woven fabric that fits perfectly together. If you looked at our stained glass window in the back of the church, you don't just look at the red or the gold or the white that's there. You look at the whole thing and you can see the beauty that is presented there. We would be wise to never try to understand then one verse or one chapter or one story or even one book in complete isolation of the rest of the story. All the various texts are meant to be like colors of a platelet which work together to paint us a picture of this living, dynamic, profound thing that we call faith. And consequently, these texts won't be able to give us a simplistic answer to these things, but rather they lay a foundation for us upon which we build our understandings of God, our faith, and our humanity. And most importantly, one thing we should never forget and should always be reminding ourselves of is that an, an encounter with Scripture is meant to be an encounter with God, an encounter with the Word, who is Jesus himself, an encounter, an encounter guided by God's Holy Spirit. In both the churches and the faithfuls struggle to understand what God is trying to communicate to us through these human words and human authors. That's why what Jesus said in today's gospel was so controversial and startling to those who heard him. At the conclusion of the passage from Isaiah in today's gospel, Jesus says this, today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was saying to those texts that were referring to him, he was saying the scripture of Isaiah prophesy his arrival. Can you understand why then the people were up in arms and if we kept going on with the story, which we might be next week, the same group who is admiring him because of the authority he t spoke with will soon be trying to send him over the cliff, over hail, calling him a blasphemer and a heretic you can then understand what the Jews were thinking at that moment. And for us today, it's even more than that. 
in reading these sacred words, we don't simply learn something about God, we actually meet him. We encounter him. We engage him. We draw closer to him by opening up the Bible and prayerfully reading what is before us. We encounter the living God. Imagine that. That means unless we are engaged in some sort of scholarly endeavor, our interaction with sacred scripture becomes an act of faith. We come to this task with open hearts and an open mind, with a sincere desire to be more after we ponder these sacred words. Then we were before we started meditating on those words. We read these words and contemplate their meaning and pray them silently or out loud because in doing this simple act, we believe we will have a God moment, a communion with our God who wants nothing more than to make himself known to us. So that brings us back to our previous question. What can we trust about the Bible? Well, when we read these sacred words in faith, we can trust that we will encounter God in some way as God sees fit. We will also come to know Jesus a little more deeply, not just know about him. We will be led by God's Spirit to help illuminate for us what we need to see at that moment. We will become more and more configured to Christ as these words wash over us and seep into our very hearts and minds and souls, into our very being and reality. We will come to know God's great love for us and our need for him above everything else. We will experience the nearness of God, a God who never sits on the sidelines, but rather is intimately connected to and at work within the human family and within human history. And that, my friends, is not even the complete list. I've only hit the tip of the iceberg. In reality, there is really no limits as to what God can do for us and within us every time we read these sacred words in faith and in trust. And so, the answer is an enthusiastic yes. We can trust these words because in the end, it's not the words we are placing our trust in. Rather, it is God in whom we are placing our trust. A God who wants to lead us and comfort us and inspire us and transform us every day of our lives in many different ways but in a particular way, through these sacred words. So my question to you is how often are you diving in communion with God through his holy word? Is it only at mass and never to look at the scripture again and even at mass not to be fully alerted to what is being proclaimed in the sacred text? Are you spending any time outside of Mass discovering God's love for you through his holy word? I got a challenge for you, and I gave you the challenge last year as well. My challenge is simply this. Spend the first 15 minutes of your waking hour meditating on the daily passages of Scripture. And it won't be hard to do. Open up the parish app, look under the daily readings, 
push the button, and voila, the readings of the day will magically appear before your eyes so that you can meditate upon what the entire universal church is meditating upon. As you read those sacred words, to think you are in communion with the 3.5 million masses that are being offered across the globe. Somewhere somebody is celebrating mass with the readings that you are meditating upon at no matter what hour you're meditating. You are in communion with the universal Catholic Church, but that's not what's the most important. You will be encountering the living God. My friends, if you take this step seriously and give yourself 15 minutes every morning meditating upon the Word of God, I'll tell you one thing that might happen. You won't look at your watch during Mass anymore because you will be absorbed in God's love, in God's mercy, because you have become so transformed by it in the course of the week. Many of us are spiritually hungry. We're starving ourselves spiritually because we think an hour a week and a little piece of the body of Christ is enough for our spiritual nourishment. It's not. We need God more than for an hour a week. We need God daily. Jesus didn't say, give us our weekly bread. He said, give us our daily bread. Give yourself a gift. Start spending tomorrow 15 minutes. That's it. If you want to set a timer, you got my permission. Meditating on God's word and see where you're going to be at at the start of Lent, which is only about 80 days away. <laughs>